Okay. Uh, so this session is basically going to cover your common obstetric emergencies. Uh, this is a very vast area because there are a lot of obstetric emergencies that are involved in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, obstetrics in general is a very high flow, high stress, uh, you know, condition in uh, to work in. So I have covered a few of the ones that I find were uh, were the ones that we commonly see. And uh, I've discussed it with uh, our uh, speakers who are coming in as well. So let's begin. I am basically going to give you an overview of all the topics. And uh, uh, Madhura Ma'am was actually called for a, a maternal mortality session. So if possible, she'll be joining at the end. Uh, if not, we have Tanvi Ma'am, who's here from KEM, who will be giving us some of the clinical insight into what they usually see when they are actually working uh, with patients. So let's start. So in this session, we're going to look at common obstet obstetric emergencies and how to approach them. We will also be discussing cases as usual. So let's start. Yeah. Uh, you have to know the basics to be able to deal with any emergency uh, in obstetrics. So obviously the basics is knowing what labor is and what are the stages of labor. So normal labor obviously is the process through which the fetus and placenta are delivered from the uterus through the vagina. So there is a passenger that is your fetus. There is a passage that is your vagina. And there is a push that is applied by the mother. So these three things have to work uh, together with each other for the normal labor to progress uh, properly. Uh, normal birth, according to WHO, is spontaneous in onset and low risk at the start of the labor and remains low risk throughout labor and delivery. You will see as we move ahead what are you know, some of the high risk conditions that women experience and... Uh, what are some of the emergencies that consequently lead to? Uh, the infant has to be born spontaneously in the vertex position. So the normal delivery, which you see, is a vertex position. And between 37 to 42 weeks of pregnancy. And at birth, the, birth, the mother and both the infant are in good condition. So moving on to the stages of labor, you have three stages. Before those, you have something called Braxton Hicks contractions. These are irregular and they don't increase in intensity or frequency. So a lot of the times women will come to you with complaints of say abdominal pain, but it stays constant throughout and it's not at regular intervals. I remember when I was in my uh, OBGY posting as a final year student, uh, I was in the head of department unit and his favorite question to ask was, what is normal labor? And the definition is very important. And what is those contractions, the regularity of the contractions is what he stressed on. So every word and everything that the, uh, the definitions imply are important because there are conditions that don't match with that. And obviously they're abnormal. Uh, Braxton Hicks contractions also are not more than one or two per hour and they resolve with movement or change in activity. Whereas when you go into stage one, you start with the regular contractions. They are more rhythmic, they're longer and they're stronger. And typically every 10 to 15 minutes, they increase every by uh, to every two to three minutes. There is effacement of the cervix. So what it means is the normal length of the cervix will start shortening. If this is my uterus and this is the part of the cervix below it, the uterus will start changing its shape in such a way that the lower canal of the cervix will start changing its shape to becoming more and more uh, in line with the uterus and the length of the straight canal will start decreasing. That is effacement. Dilation, very obvious. If this is the size of the cervix, it will dilate and become bigger. So first stage is from when your contractions start to maximum dilation, that is 10 centimeters. Stage two is with full dilation, that is from 10 centimeters onwards to the delivery of the baby. Uh, there is a strong urge from the mother to push. And if uh, uh, everything progresses smoothly, you move on to the third stage, which is the delivery of the placenta, which usually happens between five to 10 minutes, but can take up to an hour. And you should normally allow it to progress spontaneously and don't pull on the cords while the delivery is happening. 
Okay, we have a video to show you how normal labor actually progresses. Today, you will describe the mechanisms of the labor. Is it audible? Any phallic logic line, which is the most common presentation. Engagement. Engagement is when the largest diameter of the feet and head fits into the largest diameter of the maternal pelvis. As the feet and head engages, the head moves towards the pelvic rim in either the left or right reciprocal transverse position, so the widest part of the head fits through the widest part of the pelvic inlet. Descent. Here, the baby descends through the pelvic inlet towards the pelvic floor. Descent occurs because of use right contraction, pressure of the amniotic fluid, and voluntary contraction of the abdominal muscles by maternal effort. Flexion. As the fetus descends, its head comes into contact with the pelvic floor. This causes flexion of the fetal neck chin to chest, allowing the presenting part of the fetus to be sub regmatic This creates a smaller diameter for the passage through the pelvis. Internal rotation. The pelvic floor has a gusser shape with a forward and downward slope. This allows the head to eventually rotate from the left or right occipito transverse position 90 degrees medial to an occipito anterior position to lie under the supramedial arch. This eventually results in crowning. Crowning is clinically noted when the head no longer retreats after contractions and becomes visible at the volume. Extension. Here, the ossicum slips beneath the superbeaming arch, causing the extension of the fetal head. As this extension occurs, the fetal head pushes against the perineum, causing it to stretch. External rotation and restitution. The head externally rotates to face the right or left medial thigh of the mother. At the same time, the shoulders are also rotating from a transverse position to an anterior posterior position to realign 90 degrees with the head. This realignment is called restitution, delivery of the shoulders and body. The midwife applies downward traction to the fetal head to assist the delivery of the anterior shoulder below the suprapubic arch. This is followed by upward traction, assisting the delivery of the posterior shoulder. The baby can then be delivered. Before labor, the baby can be in a number of different positions. These positions could be predicted by a thorough pregnant abdominal examination. In a longitudinal presentation, the baby could either be breech or cephalic. In cephalic, the baby could be occipital anterior and move clockwise right occipital anterior, right transverse, right occipital posterior, occipital posterior, left occipital posterior, left occipital transverse, left occipital anterior, and back to the start occipital anterior. The baby could also be in the following two transverse positions, a right transverse position, and the left transverse position. Less commonly, the baby could be in an oblique position, right or left. Today, we have described the mechanisms of labor and the positions of the baby in the pelvis. Okay, um, was, did you guys understand what the video was trying to explain? Do you guys understand the mechanism of labor? What are the steps involved? Yes, no. Do you want me to play it again? Okay, good. Uh, moving on. So one of the emergencies that might happen during your progress of labor is something called as cord prolapse. Now, cord prolapse is when your umbilical cord descends through the cervix. It can be with the presenting part of the fetus. Now, as you saw in the video, 
the presenting part is usually the head or the cephalix and uh, it can be in different positions occipital anterior posterior things like that so if the cord comes before the head or with the head it's called a prolapse right it is of three types you have something called as occult prolapse or hidden where the cord is compressed between the presenting part and the pelvis and it cannot be felt or seen during vaginal examination because the cord is down low but it's not up to the os where you actually palpate and uh, where you do vaginal examination the second is cord prolapse in front of the fetal head so the cord has prolapsed it's in front and can be felt as a pulsating mass during vaginal examination whereas complete cord prolapse the cord can be seen protruding from the vagina itself right so these are your three types of cord prolapse how do you manage these cases i'm not going into too much detail because it's going to be a very long lecture otherwise but we'll cover it briefly uh what you actually do is you obviously have to notify obstetrics and gynecology and you avoid handling the cord to reduce vasospasm your natural instinct is kuch bahar aa raha hai usko kheech dete hain right don't do that <laughs> or don't push it back in it's not going to help do not handle the cord do not mess with the cord at all what you can do is you can elevate the presenting part which is the head or the buttocks depending on whatever the presentation is you elevate it so you can lift it off the vagina uh, you can lift it off the cord so that you don't damage the cord and you don't so you can prevent any uh, loss of flow or you know damage to the cord you shift the position of the mother you uh, encourage her to be get into left lateral position with her head down and a pillow placed under the left head or left hip or a knee chest position which you can see here so automatically with gravity you would want it to go back inside you can also consider tocolytics whereas you can give turbutyly and you can go for an immediate delivery so if the cervix is dilated if the head is visible and there is a strong urge to push you can start pushing and you can go for a cervical cesarean delivery if none, none of this is possible you give turbutyly that is 0.25 mg subq to minimize the contractions right because you if you're going to go for a cesarean section uh you want to minimize the contraction until obstetrics and gynecology can come come and help you out with the situation right uh, another possible thing that you can do if you are not in a hospital setting if suppose you are in a periphery if you are in a phc you can fill the bladder to keep the head high what you can do is you put insert a catheter and you put uh, put an indwelling catheter and 500 ml of saline so what it will do is if you inflate the bladder it will lift the presenting part of the head upwards which what to, which is what you were trying to do manually as well right okay any questions in terms of cord prolapse anything you would want to add than me ma'am i uh, guess i would actually like to share one of the cases that we had i hope i'm audible yes yes you're on so uh, cord prolapse is one of the uh, uh, it's it's a very uh, important emergency considering that there is a, a very high risk for the uh, baby so uh, we had this case um, basically it is an absolute indication for uh, an emergency section just in in case the uh, cervix is not fully dilated and you literally got to mobilize the patient uh, from the examination point of view into the ot and all of that has to be has to be done within 5 to 10 minutes so we had this case uh, a woman with uh, gdm that is that is gestational diabetes so she presented to the rr in labor and uh, while she was uh, you know getting ready for examination uh, there was uh, her water broke that's what we call when uh, the amniotic fluid uh, comes out so uh, of course a gdm case had a uh, polyhydramnios uh, polyhydramnios cases have uh, a high higher tendency to have cord prolapse so uh, there was cord prolapse the pulsations uh, uh, when the pv was done the pulsations of the cord were felt so uh, we monitor fetal distress by uh, the heartbeat of the fetus so by the pulsations we came to know that uh, the uh, heartbeat of the baby was decreasing so it it, it just meant that uh, the baby had very uh, a high risk for uh, you know and it had to be uh, 
delivered out very soon. So the delivery time, I mean, uh, from the examination point of view to the delivery time, it was literally five minutes, and the patient was mobilized so fast that uh, you know uh, the baby also survived. So it's one of the uh, very important emergencies, and it has to be diagnosed. Um, so, yeah, so especially in all of these obstetric emergencies, make sure everything is prepared as interns, your residents will tell you to do the blood grouping, get the blood ready, all of that because of how fast you need to work. As ma'am mentioned, within five to 10 minutes, they had to mobilize the patient. So time is of the essence. Okay, uh, moving on, we have something called as sh shoulder dystocia. Now, this is a complication of vaginal delivery in which the shoulder, usually the left side, fails to deliver spontaneously after the head has come out. So when you saw the state, the, the mechanism and the stages, uh, in the mechanism, you saw that the head came out and then the shoulder came out. If that does not happen normally, your shoulder can get stuck inside, which can lead to damage to the brachial plexus, which is one of the commonest causes of brachial plexus injury. And uh, I have also uh, seen it when I was posted in the NICU. I remember my NICU resident telling me that uh, uh, one of the women underwent shoulder dystocia and there was some complication with her delivery and uh, there was a damage to the brachial plexus cord. So again, quite common. So it's important to know how to handle these cases. Uh, there are certain risk factors that are involved with shoulder dystocia that can be maternal, fetal or labor related. In maternal uh, factors, you have an abnormal pelvic anatomy, gestational or uh, pre-gestational diabetes. As ma'am mentioned, GDM, again, a risk factor for uh, cord prolapse and for shoulder dystocia. Then any post-term pregnancy, uh, previous history of shoulder dystocia, short stature, any, uh, you know, very short females, especially in India, uh, because we don't have... Uh, we, we struggle with uh, malnutrition and things like that. A lot of the women are generally of short stature. Obese women, again, very commonly seen. I have seen so many obese women coming during my internship and postings as well, who end up having uh, a lot of complications, especially during labor. So uh, this is definitely a risk factor. And large infants. So uh, macrosomic babies, diabetes, in diabetes, the women uh, have large babies. So any large infants, again, there is a risk of shoulder dystocia because it's difficult for the head and the shoulders to pass through the pelvic in, uh, outlet and excessive weight gain. In fetal, uh, fetal risk factors, again, macrosomia, labor related, if it's an operative vaginal delivery, if you have a protractive active phase or a prolonged second stage. We saw the stages of labor. If the second stage, that is from complete dilation to delivery of the baby, if that is very long, then there is again a chance of shoulder dystocia and any precipitous delivery. Now, one of the most commonly seen signs, and if you're planning on giving any exams as well, is asked and very easy to spot clinically, is called the turtle sign, where the head comes out from the uh, perineum, but it retracts back in because again, the shoulder is stuck inside. So it'll get, it'll pull the baby back in. Okay. These are very helpful mnemonics to remember what to do when you're faced with such a situation. You have to avoid your four P's. That is punic, pulling, pushing, and pivoting. Don't try to push the baby. Don't pull the baby. It's not going to help. It's just going to cause more damage. That is what, you know, logical thinking, right? do not do that. That is not going to help. There are specific maneuvers that are done to help remove the uh, shoulder smoothly so that there are no injuries. We look at them in the next slide. What you actually need to do is you something you can remember from the helper mnemonic. H, call for help. Immediately call for help. You need more support. E, evaluate for an episiotomy. What is an episiotomy? An episiotomy is a cut on the perineum, uh, is an incision on the perineum, which is done to assist the uh, labor process and to smoothly uh, get the head out of the perineum. Then legs. What you can do is something called a Macro Roberts maneuver. You will see all of the maneuvers in the next slide. P, you can give suprapubic pressure that is above the pubic. You can give, give uh, a push which causes the shoulder to move downwards and come out. 
you can do an enter maneuvers that is internal rotation of the baby or you can remove the posterior arm whereas you try the, try to get the other arm out so that the stuck arm also comes out and you can roll the patient where you can put them in all fours position this i know is a little difficult to understand it's something everyone struggled with even when we were giving final year exams to understand what the maneuvers are so it's always helpful to have some visual cues Delighted to be here today to talk about the prompt uh, shoulder dystocia training. Uh, Kathy, one of our research panelists, and I are going to go through the maneuvers today. So, to try and illustrate for you how best to manage shoulder dystocia condition, we all know is unpreventable. Is it audible? Therefore, we just need to be able to manage it as best we can. So, Kathy, I wonder if we could get straight on uh, with the maneuvers. Mm -hmm. One of the things about shoulder dystocia I always think is. It's a bony problem, and I always use the analogy of it's like a truck going through a low bridge. So can you imagine the cab of the truck gets through the bridge, but the back of the truck bangs up against the bridge? So can you see the cab is like the baby's head, and can you see the shoulder is stuck behind the pubic symphysis? So it's a bony problem. Just pulling the cab through the bridge is going to damage either the truck or the bridge. So the first thing, Cathy, I wonder if we could try is diagnostic traction. So the key issue here is you need to know there's an impaction. And it's really important, just as Cathy's doing, to pull in the direction of the spine, axial traction. Now, I think when we were young, people definitely used to pull right down, they used to crouch down to try and pull the truck underneath the bridge. But we know now that that's more damaging. So just see, is it coming, yes or no? The first thing then to do is call for help. You need the team around you. You're going to need a person for each leg from Roberts, and we're definitely going to need someone to do superior pressure as well as the person uh, looking after the baby's head. Now, first thing, call for help. Second thing, let's do McRoberts. So, so McRoberts, if you can imagine the bridge is tilted slightly forward, then making the bridge vertical makes uh, the arch higher. The woman's the same size, but it just helps you get the shoulders, the truck, through the bridge. So, so Kathy. So, I've pulled mum down the bed. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm going to make her flat. And then I'm going to take her legs right back so her sides are against her abdomen. And that lifts the bottom off the bed. Okay. And I'll need somebody both sides so that we're both supporting the legs. So, once the bottom's off the bed, just as Kathy you said, then I think that shows you've got McRoberts in the right position. The second thing is, if you do suprapubic pressure, that presses down on the anterior shoulder. That's it, perfectly. And I think like a CPR, CPR position. Yeah. And can you imagine, you need to push down on the truck, not the bridge. So Kathy's now pushing down and across to get the shoulder slightly in the oblique, so down and in the oblique if you can. So if that is unsuccessful, we need to move to internal maneuvers. Just to give you an illustration again using the truck and bridge analogy, can you imagine the bridge is like a heart shape? If you could rotate the shoulders into the two o'clock or 10 o'clock, you've got more space to run through the bridge. However, if you can deliver the posterior arm, that's like taking the wheels off the truck, it drops it down 10% and you can run it through the bridge. So Kathy, I wonder if we could kind of attempt those th two things. So if I'm gonna do an internal maneuver, I need to put my hand scrunched up. We call it the Pringle maneuver. So that's as if you were getting the last Pringle out of the carton. Um, and I'm putting my whole hand in at the base. So at six o'clock, not leaving my thumb out, I'm putting the whole hand in with the aim that I'm going to find the posterior arm. Babies often come down the birth canal like, like pharaohs, and so you can grasp that posterior arm and just deliver it straight up, just like you were putting your arm up in class. The idea of that is that the baby's now one arm's width narrower, and so that anterior shoulder should drop underneath the pubic arch and you can deliver the baby. Um, any traction I do would be in an axial direction. So never downwards, but axial as if you're pulling along. And in this instance, we would deliver the baby. Great. So, so let's say that delivers the baby for this one, but, but some babies, the arm is straight and you can't deliver the posterior arm very easily. And I always think, going back to the analogy, 
imagine the bridge is like a heart shape, then can you imagine if you could rotate the back of the truck to either 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock, there's more room than there is at 12 o'clock. Okay, so this time I'm putting my whole hand in again and I put my hand in at the bottom and this time I can't feel a posterior arm and therefore all I can feel is the shoulders. So I'm going to aim to rotate the shoulders. So I will push on the front of the bottom shoulder and I'll ask an assistant to do superpute pressure towards that wall. So as we do that, we're rotating those shoulders into the oblique and the shoulder is released and comes under the pubic arch. And it still may be worth trying some diagnostic traction to make sure that's released. Now, those manoeuvres in themselves seem to be effective, certainly in the last series we published of 17,500 consecutive general births, no further manoeuvres were required. And I think it's important we do the manoeuvres that we know as well as we can do. This is the RCOG algorithm which lists all of the manoeuvres that we've just demonstrated here now. You can see that you take step-by-step -step approach to the manoeuvres. If you get to the bottom and you've found that they haven't worked, it recommends you go back to the start and start with the McRoberts manoeuvre again. So take the legs out and put them back in. It may be appropriate if the mother's mobile to put her onto all fours position because just the movement into all fours may be helpful at releasing the shoulders. We also have documentation and this is the RCOG Proforma for documenting um, each manoeuvre so that it's very clear after the event what actions were taken. If you'd like to learn more about how prompt Okay, uh, did you guys understand the maneuvers? Like, did you understand what they were trying to do? So they essentially did the helper mnemonic. They called for help. They evaluated for an epi. They did the McRoberts maneuver. They gave suprapubic pressure. They did the internal rotation. And they tried moving the posterior arm. Clear? Can we move ahead? Yes, no. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to another very important topic, uh, which is antepartum hemorrhage. So, uh, antepartum hemorrhage is defined as bleeding from or in the genital tract occurring from 24 weeks of pregnancy and prior to the uh, birth of the baby. So, antepartum hemorrhage is uh, can be of three categories. Basically, you can have a placental bleed, which is 70% of the cases. These are further subcategorized into placenta previa and abruptio placenta or abruption of the placenta. You can have unexplained or indeterminate causes of antepartum hemorrhage or you can have extra placental causes. So you can have any local lesions in your cervix or your vagina. So it can be a polyp, it can be a cancerous region, it can be varicose veins or even local trauma. So what is placental abruption? Uh, what, what happens in placental abruption is the placenta separates from its bed uh, and it because of the premature separation, uh, separation there's a lot of bleeding that happens uh, because the barrier, the damage to the fetus that happens is not just because the barrier that makes the clot between the placental blood and villi, but also it releases prostaglandins and causes uterine spasm. So in essence, what's happening is the placenta is getting separated. It's causing a release of prostaglandins and causing the uterus to contract. Now, there is a classification of placental abruption. It can be 0, 1, 2, and 2, 3. Uh, class 0 is asymptomatic. You have uh, no damage to the fetus or you cannot discover it until after birth. Class 1, there is uterine tenderness and mild uh, no or mild vaginal bleeding and the vital signs are normal. There is no damage to the fetus. Class 2 is where you have moderate amount of hemorrhage and moderate to severe contractions and there is maternal tachycardia. Also, the fetus, will, the fetus starts going into distress and bradycardia. So, whenever the we make sure whenever a woman is in labor, we do constant fetal monitoring and uh, we also do their uh, cardiotopograms to make sure that we can uh, instantly detect if the if there is any fetal distress. Class three is heavy vaginal bleeding with painful tetanic uterus, maternal shock, and coagulopathy. 
the fetal effect is obviously it can lead to fetal death. How do you manage a case of placental abruption? So first things first, you obviously do a general examination and abdominal examination. You check for the fetal status. So you will do that with your handheld Doppler, uh, which you connect to the fetus, or you can do it with the Dopplers that are available in the labor ward. And you also do a cardiotopogram. You grade the abruption as we did class 0, 1, 2, 3. You do their hemoglobin hematocrit coagulation profile. Very important because they can have such severe hemorrhage that you might have to transfuse a lot of blood. You will also do their ABO and RH grouping. Emergency measures, obviously, insert two large bore IVs. You give them crystalloids. You might have to do a blood transfusion. You have to constantly keep checking their urine output to check if the hydration is proper or not and fetal monitoring. Once you've resuscitated the, present, uh, the patient, you check for the kind of abruption. Now, if it is revealed that you can tell that uh, uh, if it is revealed and you can see that the patient is in labor, you will do an artificial rupture of the membranes. You will give oxytocin and proceed with the vaginal delivery. If the patient is not in labor, you will either do an ARM with oxytocin and vaginal delivery or you will go into a cesarean delivery, which has specific indications. If it is a concealed abruption, you will do a delivery using either cesarean section or vaginal delivery. You have to continue to give oxytocin or uh, ox uh, ox oxytocin to improve uterine tone along with blood transfusion because you have to make sure that uh, the woman does not lose too much blood that can lead to maternal and fetal compromise. Right? Okay. The management, pretty simple, revealed, concealed, in labor, you proceed for a vaginal delivery, not in labor, you take a call if she needs a vaginal delivery or if she needs a cesarean section. If it's concealed, you have to definitely go into delivery, either you do vaginal or cesarean. Did you guys understand abruption? Anything you want to add, ma'am? Uh, no, this was quite good. Okay. okay, moving on. Uh, placenta previa. Same, another cause of uh, antipartum hemorrhage, obstetric complication. Now, here, the major difference that you need to remember is abruption presents as painful vaginal bleeding because one, it's starting to stimulate the contractions of the uterus as well. Whereas, previa will present with painless vaginal bleeding. So something that is classically told by women is they woke up in the middle of the night in a pool of blood, right? So they didn't feel anything. They just woke up surrounded by blood. So that is a very classical history that they'll give you. And they'll never realize that the bleeding or they'll never realize that the bleeding started if it is not that major. Uh, so it's in the third trimester, secondary to an abnormal placentation near or covering the internal cervical os. So what they mean is either it can be covering your entire os, the opening is covered, or it can be low-lying where it is close to the os, but the os is still open. Or here you can see what a normal placenta looks like. Okay. Uh, now management. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, right? You go for an elective delivery at 36 to 37 weeks via a cesarean section presents so patients with a history if they have a history of placenta previa and vaginal bleeding you check their vitals you obviously do fetal monitoring you insert two large bore iv lines you do blood grouping typing screening and coagulations if she presents with substantial bleeding then you have to obviously give a blood transfusion if there is excessive or continuous vaginal bleeding you go for a cesarean section regardless of the gestational age because obviously if the os is completely covered then you won't be able to proceed with a vaginal delivery. If the bleeding subsides, you can proceed with expectant management where you can wait until the woman reaches 36 weeks of pregnancy, where you can advise her bed rest, reduced activity and avoiding the intercourse. Right? So that's after 36 weeks, you can move on for a cesarean section. Okay. So this was antipartum hemorrhage. You have abruption and placenta previa. These are things that you need to know. Again, very common. They'll present to you um, quite frequently. Okay. You had antipartum hemorrhage. You have its corresponding postpartum hemorrhage. 
So one thing I would like to add here is that uh, in any case of antipartum hemorrhage, whenever the woman presents uh, to you, the first thing that you do is uh, assess the hemodynamic status of the woman, and uh, the hemoglobin uh, should be traced immediately. And regardless, two to three uh, units of blood should be cross matched because you never know how much blood uh, the patient is going to lose or has already lost. Right. Um, again, as interns, you will be used to this, and you should be to constantly be running to the blood bank uh, because it's essential to have those uh, blood units cross matched and ready to go. Okay. Uh, moving on to postpartum hemorrhage. So postpartum hemorrhage is defined as five greater than 500 ml of expected blood loss in a vaginal delivery or greater than 1000 ml of expected blood loss in a cesarean delivery. Now it's of two types, primary and secondary. Primary PPH occurs within 24 hours and secondary PPH occurs after 24 hours of delivery. The causes of postpartum hemorrhage are very easy to remember. It's the four T's. You have the tone. So if it's a atonic uterus, tissue that is retained placenta or any bits of the placenta that are left back, trauma, so any laceration to the genital tract, fourth thrombin. So if they have any coagulation defects, they will bleed postpartum. Okay. So this is basically the algorithm for uh, primary postpartum hemorrhage. Again, we did the four T's. So if you have a poor, poor uterine tone, on abdominal palpation, the uterus will feel relaxed, boggy, and soft. And the uterine fundus can be above the umbilicus if the uterus cavity is filled with blood and clots. What are the investigations you want to do? Obviously, you will do a full blood count. You'll do a coagulation profile. You'll do the uh, urea and electrolytes. If the patient is not responsive to fluid and blood replacement, you will do an ultrasound. You have to exclude any uterine rupture or intraperitoneal bleeding. Then how do you manage the patient? You will, if it's the uterus is atonic, you, you have to increase the tone. So you give uterotonic agents. You will give oxytocin, prostaglandins, and ergot alkaloids. You can also do something called as balloon tamponade. Uh, there is a specific catheter that we use for uh, tamponading. And uh, you can, if, if that is also not available, you can do that with a normal catheter as well. Uh, again, if... Uh, if the cause is not atonic, it can be either a tear or trauma. So what you will get is bleeding from areas of trauma within the genital tract. You can have a uterine rupture or you can have tears during the cesarean section. Um, what are the investigations? Again, you have to uh, inspect during the cesarean section by exteriorization and you do an ultrasound to look for any free fluids in patients with uterine rupture. Management, you have to repair the identified trauma, any site of bleeding. And you can also do pelvic artery embolization, where you will essentially reduce the blood flow to the uterus. So you will prevent the bleeding that is happening. Third cause, retained tissue. Again, if you have retained placenta or membranes, you can identify using biomanual examination. Investigation, the only option is you have to examine the patient under anesthesia. And management is you manually remove any products of concept, uh, conception that are left behind. Coagulopathy, the uterus tone is fine. There are no tears or trauma. There is no retained tissue, but the patient is still bleeding. So that gets you to your fourth T, where you have continuous bleeding with a contracted uterus. You will do a full blood count, coagulation profile, urea and electrolytes, and management. You obviously have to immediately replace blood and give coagulation factors and platelets. Or you can do surgical management if there is tone, uh, if there's any trauma or atonic hemorrhage. Moving on to secondary postpartum hemorrhage. This is from 12 hours to 12 weeks after delivery. So if there's any endometritis, post aneurysm, uterine artery, or any retained tissue. So if there's endometritis, you'll have tenderness on examination. There's guarding and rigidity. If if there is the involvement of the entire peritoneum. So if you have peritonitis, you will do an ultrasound to look for any retained products of con conception or if she has an abscess. So if she got infected and she developed an abscess, then you can look at it on an ultrasound. You will also do a high vaginal swab to look for infectious causes. 
management antibiotics and you admit the patient for antibiotics if uh, the patient is systemically unwell and hemodynamically unstable. If there is profuse bleeding, if the patient is in shock, you might suspect a uterine artery pseudoaneurysm. You do a Doppler, you do an MRI and you do a pelvic angio. Management antibiotics if it's related to infection and you correct the blood volume. Surgical is embolization. Retain tissue similar to what you did in, um, uh, you know, in primary uh, antibiotic hemorrhage. But here, the retained tissue is likely to get infected. So you'll have foul smelling or offensive vaginal discharge, fever and uterine tenderness. You do an ultrasound to look for pelvic abscess or any retained products of conception and you get managed by antibiotics. Okay. PPH, are we clear with for the four T's and the management? Yes, no. Do you want me to repeat anything? Okay. Okay. Another very important obstetric emergency is hypertension in pregnancy. So hypertension in pregnancy is essentially an umbrella term involving a lot of uh, different categories of how we subcategorize the hypertension. So you have something called chronic hypertension, whereas the BP in which the BP is more than 140 by 90 before pregnancy or before 20 weeks of gestation. Uh, whereas you compare it to gestational hypertension, this is hypertension that develops during the pregnancy. If the hypertension resolves 12 weeks postpartum, the diagnosis is changed to transient hypertension. Preeclampsia is essentially hypertension after 20 weeks of pregnancy with proteinuria. What is proteinuria? More than 300 milligrams of protein in a 24-hour collection or more than plus one or urine drip. If you don't get protein urea, suppose the patient comes to you with a blood pressure of 150 by 100 and you didn't get a protein urea on your urine analysis, that does not rule out preeclampsia. You have to have a clinical suspicion for this patient if there are symptoms involved. So if she has something like headache, blurring of vision, abdominal pain, low platelets, elevated liver enzymes, you still have to then proceed with this clinical suspicion. Preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension where the woman had hypertension before pregnancy or before 20 weeks and has now developed preeclampsia. Now, understanding why this happens is basically because of um, decreased cytoplast, uh, cytotrophoblast migration. So the spiral arteries inside your uterus are not developing properly and they lead to placental ischemia and there's release of soluble and anti-angiogenic uh, and inflammatory factors. So there's oxid oxidative stress and there's endo endothelial dysfunction. So basically, if you don't remember anything about hypertension, remember the definitions and remember that the cause lies in the placenta. Once the placenta comes out, the blood pressure should normalize. Okay, preeclampsia. Now, what are the symptoms? So you will have something like severe headache, changes in vision, upper abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, decreased urine output, shortness of breath. So if you think about it from head to toe, it's much easier. Headache, blurring of vision, vomiting, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, decreased urine output. Um, again, the organs that are going to be affected is your liver, which will lead to HELP syndrome and your kidneys. Then you'll also have something called fetal, uh, fluid retention. So it starts in the lower limbs and can eventually extend up to the face and your upper limbs as well. What is HELP syndrome? HELP syndrome is a further complication of preeclampsia where you have something called hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. So hemolysis, the diagnosis requires two of the things. Abnormal peripheral blood smear where you have schistocytes or bird cells elevated serum bilirubin, low serum haptoglobin, and a significant drop in hemoglobin unrelated to any blood loss. There is elevated liver enzymes, that is AST or ALT, more than twice their upper normal limit, and LDH more than twice the upper normal limit, and low platelets. Platelets less than one lakh. Okay, hypertension in pregnancy, again, very important. It's important to know which hypertensives are safe for women, and what do you start with? So 
blood pressure 140 to by 90 to 159 by 104 hypertension you do not need to admit them but severe hypertension above 160 to 110 need to be admitted you start with your initial management on antihypertensive. Your first choice is labetalol, second is nifedipine, and third is methyl dopa. What you're trying to aim for is you want their blood pressure to come down to 135 by 85 or less. Uh, I'm sure in real life practice, it's a lot more difficult to get them to comply and make sure their blood, blood pressure lies in this range. But that's what you aim for. So monitoring, you do blood pressure monitoring once or twice a week in the hypertension. You also check for protein urea and you do certain blood tests that include your full blood count, your liver function and your renal function tests. Uh, you also assess the fetus. So you will auscultate for the fetal heartbeat. You will do an ultrasound at diagnosis and every two to four weeks or two weeks, depending on the severity of the hypertension. You will also do a cardio tocograph if it is clinically indicated. Again, you want to check for viability of the fetus. Next, then you check for your dipstick. You check for proteins. So if your dipstick is positive, you want to quantify how much is the protein urea. So you do a protein to creatinine ratio or you do an albumin to creatinine ratio. Um, if you're not sure about the diagnosis, you retest with a new sample and you always assess clinically as well. In obstetrics and gynecology, especially I've noticed your cl clinical acumen has to be just as good as your lab investigations. So you check for signs and symptoms. You look for severe headache. You look for uh, problems with vision, severe pain below the ribs, vomiting, sudden swelling of the face, hands and feet. And you also check for other investigations. So any falling platelet count, abnormal liver function, evidence of hemolysis. So basically you're doing out help. If you have none of these symptoms or you don't have protein ureas, you can continue monitoring if they're less than 37 weeks. If they're above 37 weeks, you can move towards, uh, uh, you can check for the indications for birth and you can assess a um, senior obstetrician or you can move towards delivery. Right? Uh, did you guys understand labet, nifedipine, methyl dopa, monitoring, protein urea, blood tests, and Accordingly, with clinical suspicion, you progress. Okay. Uh, in preeclampsia, it's somewhat similar. Um, the assessment remains the same, only with more frequent assessment. So if you're doing the blood pressure, you're checking it every 48 hours. Or if there's severe hypertension, you're checking it every 15 to 30 minutes. You're doing blood tests more frequently. And uh, if now in severe pre in severe hypertension in preeclampsia, you need to remember that you have to admit them to the hospital for these indications. That is sustained systolic pressure above 140. If the investigations are concerning, if there is any sign of impending pulmonary edema, if there is a sign of impending eclampsia, we'll cover what eclampsia is. If there is fetal compromise, so when you were monitoring the fetus, if you see late decelerations or if you see a compromise in say fetal, if decrease in fetal movements, things like that, or any other concerning signs, then you have to immediately admit and assess if you can go for an early birth or if you can wait and make sure that her blood pressure is maintained. That's it for hypertension in pregnancy. What is the complication of this is eclampsia. So eclampsia is basically a grand mal seizure activity and or unexplained coma, coma during pregnancy with a woman having signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. It occurs obviously after 20 weeks of gestation or in the postpartum period. So the, the grand mal seizures that they have, have two phases. Phase one is 15 to 20 seconds and it will begin, begin with facial, facial twitching. The body will become rigid and lead to muscle contractions. Phase two is 60 seconds, starts in the jaw, moves to the muscle of the face and eyelids, and then spreads throughout the body. Then followed by coma or unconsciousness and a period of hyperventilation. Because your body is now hyperventilating to, uh, to basically uh, compensate for the loss of consciousness. Management of eclampsia. Uh, very important. Uh, again, a lot of women, especially in India, are predisposed towards hypertension and gestational hypertension. 
and they often don't find out that they are hypertensive until they come for the delivery itself koi booking ke liye nahi jata no one goes to a lot of the women don't end up going to the hospital even when they find out that they're pregnant so they never realize no one has checked their blood pressure for them to realize so they show up with complications very often so how do you manage an eclamptic patient again a airway a b c d e in any emergency you always start there so you want to maintain their airway you give you put them in lateral decubitus you give them oxygen and you suction you will insert iv lines two large bore ivs and you have to avoid maternal injury again as we saw in the emergency medicine lecture where seizure patients are very prone to injuring themselves so you will uh, you know elevate the bed railings you might have to tie their hands and feet and things like that you also have to give them mouth guards because they might bite off their tongue things like that within 0 to 5 minutes so you have to be very quick now in this period of time you will give them magnesium sulfate which is your drug of choice for eclampsia management you give them 6 grams over 15 to 20 minutes now there are different regimens for magnesium sulfate the way you give it but that's beyond your level oh ma'am uh, what is drug of choice you have told yet before magnesium sulfate sulfate yes yeah thank you uh you continue with the maintenance dose of 2 grams per hour as continuous solution and uh suppose the seizure is still not under control you move on to severe hypertension protocol and you also do their labs you do your cbc you do basic metabolic panel you do the liver enzymes creat blood typing cross matching and fetal monitoring if it's still not under control you can give another bolus of magnesium sulfate if it is still not under control you can give lorazepam 4 mg beyond this point you might need to intubate the patient if i may interrupt uh, the drug of choice to terminate the immediate seizures uh, we actually start magnesium sulfate uh, regardless but uh, to terminate immediate seizures uh, if the patient is in anc that is if uh, so the drug of choice is levera you load the patient with 1 gram levera and then continue for uh, 500 mg bd and if the patient has already delivered as is the case with most of the uh, patients uh, with eclampsia uh, the most common period of the patient having seizures is immediate postpartum so at that time to terminate immediate seizures uh, you can give midazolam as well okay thank you ma'am so as i mentioned it's different if it is an anc mother or if it's pnc uh now if the patient is stable you can if it's an anc mother you can prepare for delivery or you might need to uh, assess if the patient needs icu care okay moving on uh so we've covered hypertension in pregnancy again very extensive topic so i would suggest you go back to the presentation if you're uh doing your obstetrics and gynecology posting uh, okay a few things to um, add in uh, hypertension is that um you, you mentioned uh, the first drug of choice is labetal all day so uh, even uh, you, you don't add the second and third drugs immediately uh, we've got to titrate uh, the doses for labetal all and then uh, pds or qid 100 mg 200 mg whatever and then add the rest of the drugs so you have to minimize because our indian patients are uh, not really uh, compliant so it's better for them to have a uh, minimum uh, tablets as possible uh, in pre eclampsia uh, the uh, monitoring of the blood pressure should be done qid okay. uh, yeah and uh, in eclampsia one of the main uh, one of the major things that you have to watch for uh, are signs of uh, increase in intracranial tension so you don't want uh, uh, herniation or uh, anything like that right ma'am what are the specific signs you would look for uh this first of all uh, we got to get a fundus exam done uh watch for disorientation of the woman uh yeah okay and a brisk brisk knee jerk reflexes that is one of the first things that uh, starts to occur okay okay uh, moving on to ectopic pregnancy so ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy that is implanted at a site outside the uterine cavity the most common sites include the ampulla and the isthmus of the fallopian tube uh, other sites can be ovarian cervix peritoneal cavity but these are less common 
so you can see all the other sites where the pregnancy can be uh, the implantation can take place so what are the signs and symptoms of an ectopic pregnancy um the symptoms are essentially similar to a miscarriage an upset stomach or a uti so this is the reason why a lot of the times the patients might miss it and if you're not having clinical suspicion for it you as a clinician might also miss it you might have uh, unusual vaginal bleeding you can have abdominal pain shoulder tip pain now this is referred pain that is coming from the obviously the uh, involved structures you will have bowel and bladder problems you can have obviously if she's you will have a upt positive so she might have a missed period or a late period and she might be feeling faint or collapse and it's important that you obviously make do not take pain in abdomen in a, a reproductive age female lightly uh, especially when you start seeing in a uh, working in a casualty setting every other day a woman comes to you with pain in abdomen make sure that you get her upt done if she is in the reproductive age group it is always better to err on the side of caution than to miss out and miss out on a pregnancy right and this is something that uh, actually happened with me in my last shift there was a 23 24 year old woman who had come in with her husband with complaints of just weakness mild abdominal pain and uh, nothing nothing about irregular menses i asked her her lmp and everything which was last month so it, it was pretty soon so i would not suspect say outright pregnancy but i got a upt done nonetheless and it turned out to be positive so make sure that even if they say ki nahi karana hai nahi lag raha hame kuch or even if, especially if the woman is the girl or the woman is unmarried there there will be a lot of uh, you know uh, backlash coming from the relatives or patients that how can you even suggest something like this but you have to insist on it you have to counsel the patients because missing a pregnancy is worse than actually never you know uh, proceeding and not getting a upt done okay so if you if you have a suspected ectopic pregnancy how do you move towards the management if it's an acute presentation if the patient is hemodynamically unstable you're suspecting a ruptured ectopic you have to immediately go for surgical intervention however if it is a chronic presentation stable patient you do an ultrasound done you get an ultrasound done if it is a viable intrauterine pregnancy you reassure and discharge to community if it is non diagnostic you go you consider it a pregnancy of unknown location or if you get an ectopic pregnancy you move towards surgical management or medical management now the the uh, important part is if you don't get uh, you know clear findings on a ultrasound you get your serial beta hcg is done your beta hcg levels should increase by 66% in 48 hours and you do a repeat ultrasound so after that what you can see is you again go back to the same algorithm if it's viable you reassure and discharge if it's pregnancy not uh, if you cannot uh, rule out an ectopic you move towards surgical or medical management if your beta hcg levels increase or decrease abnormally by less than 66% in 40 48 hours you do a repeat ultrasound right with plus with or without beta hcg progesterone levels endometrial biopsy or diagnostic lab if you get an ectopic pregnancy you move towards surgical or medical management if your levels of beta hcg decrease significantly by 21 to 35% in 48 hours you suspect a non viable intrauterine pregnancy or a resolving ectopic you move towards expectant management along with serial ecg monitor uh, serial beta hcg monitoring now this again is very important to know because beta hcg plays a very important role in ectopic pregnancies your monitoring of beta hcg basically determines your further management ma'am you want to add anything before we move to the cases Oh, this is good enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll quickly go over the cases. So, case one is a thirty-two-year-old woman brought to the casualty uh, six days following a vaginal de delivery at thirty-nine weeks of gestation. Her pregnancy and labor were unremarkable, and the placenta was delivered by control cord traction. On examination, she is pale with cool and clammy extremities. She is also drowsy. 
her bp is 105 by 50 pulse is 112 on abdominal palpation there is minimal tenderness but the uteri uterus is palpable approximately 6 cm above the pubic symphysis Speculum examination reveals large clots of blood in the vagina. When these are removed, the cervix is seen to be open. So, what is your diagnosis, and how will you manage your case? So, what do you guys think is the diagnosis here? Secondary PPH. Very good. How would you like to manage this case? in brief if we can go over it quickly okay first of all she is hemodynamically unstable so you have to uh, put into a large bore iv lines you have to start the uh, you have to do a full blood count you have to start the cross matching and blood grouping you have to get it done then you can see that she has large clots of blood in the vagina so that means she is bleeding from a site whereas the tone you check for the tone now if it is aton it's less likely to be atonic because it's secondary pph but if there is any retained bits of uh, placenta or if it's any tissue left back you will manage it accordingly okay so make sure you can identify these cases and manage them appropriately Case two. Thirty-two year old woman. Yes, I yes, may add. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, uh, of course, you will hemodynamically uh, stabilize the patient first, and the definitive treatment for this would be, uh, of course, after a USG, uh, you have to first see uh, what grade of the uh, RPOC is there. RPOC is retained products of conception, so obviously this is a, this because there are large clots of blood. So we are we are suspecting some retained uh, placenta. So uh, the definitive treatment would be uh, a check uretage for this patient, a blunt check uretage, considering uh, it's an obstetric uterus. Okay, uh, moving on to case two. You have a thirty-two-year-old woman who ha uh, who is on thirty-four weeks of gestation. She has complaints of headache, odd visual symptoms such as wobbling of objects. epigastric discomfort nausea and bilateral lower limb swelling on examination her bp is 140 by 85 pulse is 98 there is moderate edema of the knees fingers and face on abdominal palpation there is mild mild right upper quadrant and epigastric tenderness hemoglobin is 9.8 platelet count is 97 alanine uh, a alt is 172 and alp is 238 What is your diagnosis? Help, right? Help, yes. So this is a case of help syndrome where you have hemolysis. Again, there should be other definite other ways of confirming the hemolysis as well as we discussed before. We have elevate uh, elevated liver enzymes and we have low platelets, along with symptoms of. preeclampsia so you have the headache you have the visual symptoms the nausea bilateral lower limb swelling things like that mam you want to add anything yes cot uh, usually is uh, more than 70 and uh, the the ldh also we got to monitor it is more than 600 in a case of health Okay, in uh, case three, you are urgently called to the delivery room of a twenty-six-year-old woman to help deliver a baby. The mother is forty forty-one weeks into her second pregnancy, having had a normal term delivery of three point of a three point nine seven kilogram female infant two years ago. The baby was not moving normally prior to labor. When she arrived on uh, the labor ward, contracting. the midwife noticed that the head did not extend normally on the perineum and the chin appeared to be wedged against the perineum she had attempted delivery of the shoulders with the next two contractions but this has not been achieved what is your diagnosis and how would you like to manage right 
so this is likely a case of shoulder dystocia and the mnemonic helper uh ma'am if you are in a situation like this how do you proceed uh actually it's really difficult not to panic in such a situation <laughs> uh basically the first thing uh, that you have to do is uh, hyperflex the thighs abduct and hyperflex the uh, the thighs call for help first of all and uh, one of the uh, uh maneuvers that works the most is uh, giving supra pubic pressure so uh yeah again as you mentioned in the mnemonic call for help macrobert's position supra pubic pressure internal rotation and proceed accordingly okay case 4 a 35 year old woman arrives on the labor ward with complaints of abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding at 36 weeks of gestation the vaginal bleeding is bright red baby has been moving normally until today but she has not noticed movements since the pain started pulse is 115 bp is 110 over 62 uterus feels hard and is very tender there are no fetal sounds heard on doppler an ultrasound scan confirms that the fetus has died what is your diagnosis tell me your diagnosis first and then we'll move on to management right so this is a case of abruption of the placenta so in this case um the fetus has already died right you can confirm that there are no fetal sounds heard on doppler ultrasound scan confirms that the fetus has died so what will you do will you induce the woman or how would you like to proceed okay induction ma'am do you agree would we induce the patient uh yes in most of the cases yes we will induce the patient yeah so you would induce and remove all the products of conception or and also making sure that you don't have anything left behind okay case 5 you have a 32 year old woman with 37 weeks of gestation with complaints of abdominal pain All her pregnancy blood tests and ultrasound scans have been normal. Two hours ago, she felt a gush of clear fluid from the vagina, and since then, the pain has become more severe. Now occurring every four minutes, lasting for forty-five seconds. Um, on examination, she is comfortable between the pains. BP is one twenty-nine by seventy-six. Pulse is one one zero one per minute. Symphysio fundal height is thirty-seven centimeters, and fetus is cephalic. Vaginal examination reveals the cervix to be fully effaced and four centimeter dilated. Which stage of labor is she in? Right. So she's in the stage of labor. She started having contraction, but she's not completely dilated. That is, she's not reached ten centimeters yet. So she's in the first stage of labor. that's it uh thank you for joining everyone uh thank you tanvi ma'am for uh, uh telling us what your experience is like and sharing with us real life tips and your knowledge thank you uh that's it for today's session i kept it short because i know it can be quite overwhelming but we'll see you next time thank you ma'am